Yeah, so we have uh, a lot of material to cover. Uh, and really what we're going to be focusing on is uh, internals of symbolic debugging, uh, debuggers, and how they work and when they don't work. A lot of you have, you know, potentially used one, whether it's GDB, LLDB, Delve, if you're working with Go, and they all break in mysterious ways. So we're going to work with an example that, you know, reflects typical real-world workloads. So we have a program here which counts the number of W characters in a file terribly. And really central to this program is this function count. And what count does is loop through a buffer and uh, increment sum whenever the current character in the buffer that we're iterating over is W. So you'll compile this. In this case, this is C. We're going to use a C compiler we're using GC to compile this. We run it on etc password, and it is 16 characters. Um, so this will be compiled into an executable format that the kernel understands, so the kernel can actually load this and execute it. Uh, and the format that is typically used on modern Unix, Unixes is ELF, which stands for the executable and linking format, it includes a whole bunch of information there as far as how memory should be laid out, what regions of the file should be mapped in, and whether you need to do more funky things. If you're using, uh, if your program's dynamically linked, you may need to load other files as well. Uh, and the actual C code is compiled down to assembly. Uh, you no longer have types at uh, assembly you're interacting with memory or uh, at least on x86 processors that we're all running a very limited set of registers, registers which are essentially very much faster than memory but very limited. A, symbol a symbolic debugger is able to map this information back to types, variables, etc. So how does that work? Uh, so assuming we're inspecting a live process, typically that's done via ptrace. So ptrace will attach to the process. You can do all sorts of cool things. One of those is grab the set of all the registers uh, with respect to the context of the process. And it's available in various ways for the operating systems that matter. Uh, so a very important register there is RIP. And RIP tells you the currently executing instruction. And with the currently executing instruction, you could determine where that executable file lives. So on Linux, you have procpid maps. So in this case, uh, you know, we're in the pause system call. Uh, well, again, this is in user space context. So we're in libc, and we determine that, you know, uh, libc contains executable code. And that file also contains a whole bunch of debug information, uh, either within the file or some auxiliary file. So elf also has a notion of sections. So you have debug line, which, uh, well, actually, I'll go through all of these, so you will see very shortly what, what they do. So debug line uh, essentially contains a sequence of operations which you execute in a, a debugger executes in a state machine, and that expands into uh, a set. There is a cool animation there. Oh, there it is. I love that. Uh, that expands into a matrix which contains addresses that map to uh, you know, the source file. You have debug frame, which tells you how to unwind. So how do you, you know, what was the caller of the given function, what was the register state, et cetera. And it's very similar to debug line. You execute a massive state machine, and that expands into a matrix. Uh, and then debug info, which is very important, to essentially gives you all the details about how your program is structured. So that's type information, variable information, functions, even things like lexical scope, et cetera. It's all kind of crazy stuff. And that's re represented as a tree. And every one of those boxes is referred to as a die, debug information entity. So in our toy program, uh, you, this is what a subset of that debug info would look like. You have a, a compilation unit, wc.c, with a whole bunch of information. And within that, you have a subprogram or a function, count, uh, which has an argument buffer as a variable sum. And sum is a type. Uh, the type of the sum variable is a size t type def, which is implemented with the base type of uh, an unsigned eight byte unsigned long. Uh, so the challenge with Dwarf, Dwarf, Dwarf was implemented to support all kinds of aggressive compiler optimizations, and 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 it's it's actually Turing complete, uh, and you'll see some of the cra craziness that goes on. So over here we have our toy program with this function count, which expands into the following assembly. Uh, and the dwarf information, uh, I can't really see any of the text on my screen. Uh, so this is a dwarf information for count. So we have uh, an i variable with the type information, the subprogram. And then uh, in this case, the function was actually inlined. 
Uh, so you see the bottommost die uh, is a DW tag variable who is actually additional details are specified in the original uh, originating uh, tag variable and abstract origin essentially refers to that. And then the location, the value of the variable is actually specified in this location list below. And what this says is that, okay, if the instruction pointer is within this range, then uh, we have to execute through the state machine, push the literal zero into the dwarf state machine, and that values the current val val uh, value of i. Uh, and uh, over here it says, okay, if you're within this range, so at this point we're within the loop body, all sorts of interesting optimizations occurred, uh, you need to do a lot more stuff. So in this case it says, all right, let's push the value of RDI. So over here let's assume that i equals one in this loop. So push the value of RDI, at this point it's buffer plus one, and then push the value of RDX, and then subtract the two values, and then add the constant, uh, you, subtract, oh, you subtract them, you get four, uh, negative 4095, and then you add the constant of 4096, and then the value of i is uh, at the top of the stack at this point, which evaluates to one. Similarly for this uh, last bit of information. Uh, so in many cases, you'll see variables as being optimized out, even though they weren't actually optimized out. So we were walking through the loop body, and actually the condition in the loop body, the invariant where we're checking, okay, while we are not at the end of the buffer, that actual branch uh, is actually not included in this dwarf output. So even though the, the value of i is retrievable at this point in time, uh, you know, it isn't. So over here, we're using GDB. I set a breakpoint right at that instruction, and we see that i is optimized out. While if you go to an instruction prior, it is suddenly available, even though the value has not changed. So some compilers will emit crappy dwarf code, and sometimes you have to dig into the assembly. So a very easy way to do this is to look at the dwarf information and just see whether the set of registers involved have been mutated in any way. And if not, the value is retrieval. Uh, so that is that. And you know, what's worse is a lot of us today, when, you know, when we're choosing compilers, we focus on things like performance, compilation times, etc. But a very important factor is also debuggability. What's the quality of the dwarf output such that if you do get a crash in production or you have to debug the program, you can actually retrieve the state of the program. Uh, so Clang is an awesome compiler, but it does emit terrible dwarf code at, at the moment. Uh, in this case, uh, we're using Clang 3.62, and we essentially pause the program after, uh, uh, at, at the end of the count function, and you'll see that Clang's dwarf information actually uh, outputs uh, sum and i as being constants of zero. Uh, so, unfortunately, you cannot always trust your compiler. And this is actually a comparison with a toy application including all sorts of interesting and weird types in C99 uh, between GC and Clang, and you could see a huge gap in terms of quality of uh, debug info. Uh, the last column to the right is Node.js at O2 optimization level, and you also see that large gap. So just make sure to consider that between compilers. Uh, some languages are still very, uh, very early in their support for Dwarf. So this is a Go application. I don't like Go, uh, but we have to support Go. and uh, what happens here is that depth equals zero, we actually say, all right, let's generate a snapshot. Let's run a symbolic debugger and just grab the state of uh, all the variables in the application. Uh, and when you do that, so in this case, uh, you know, I'm using delve, you'll see that A and, you know, essentially all the variables which are initialized after this point in time have, you know, bogus values. And this is the case of bad dwarf being emitted. So in dwarf, you could actually specify, hey, these variables are only in scope within this range of instructions. And Go doesn't happen to do that. Uh, so, you know, again, you cannot trust uh, your compiler to generate the right information always. Uh, there's all sorts of other weirdness as well. So over here I have a toy application. I do, uh, you know, I corrupt uh, the, the call stack. I overflow it, trash it with memory. And uh, I run a debugger on this process. And according to the debugger, we only have one thread. So a lot of debuggers actually use ThreadDB, uh, a very crappy, uh, library which helps you, uh, which abstracts away a lot of the internals of threading implementation. So you could do things like iterate over threads in a program. And uh, again, in this case, a variable, uh, a thread has completely disappeared due to this corruption. And this is, you know, what the process actually looks like, uh, which also has interesting uh, applications for malware. Uh, 
so different operating systems have different mechanisms to handle things like threading. And you know, if you're dealing with something like Go or Haskell, where you have a notion of you know, user space threads, there's a whole bunch of other crap that has, has to go on as well. Uh, now, obviously, there are cases where things do get uh, optimized out. Uh, so in this case, uh, using different, a different set of compilation flags to compile count, and if I run a debugger, we'll see that you know, I cannot be retrieved. Why is, you know, why is that the case? Uh, so actually, the, this code in the loops over here, we're essentially looping through an array, and we're indexing off of uh, buffer, uh, off of I uh, into buffer, or into buffer off of I, and actually the, what the compiler does is determine, hey, we, we actually don't need I, let's just go ahead and use pointer semantics instead, which ends up reducing the number of registers that uh, it has to use. So in this case, I is, in fact, completely optimized out. Uh, unfortunate, this is life, uh, yeah. Uh, and then, you know, here's another example. Uh, and this is, you know, the typical reason why things are optimized out. So the count function is actually count, uh, called by main. And we'll see that arc and arg, which are the you know, first two arguments that are passed to main, are actually completely optimized out. Uh, so one thing that the compiler will try to do is make the best use of the limited set of registers and try to avoid uh, touching memory uh, if it can. So in this case, uh, the compiler knows that arg is actually never used by uh, after the call into count. So it doesn't bother uh, essentially dumping that value from a register into memory. And in this case, it's just completely unretrievable. And you know, these, these are situations where things like reversal, rever reversible debuggers are very useful. Uh, and ultimately, the platform ABI determines which registers are, have to be saved or don't have to be saved across function call boundaries, etc. cetera. Um, and then you have a lot of other weird things. So tail call optimization is you know, fairly common. So in this case, we have you know, some toy Assembly, we have main calling into the function one, which calls into three, et cetera. So the call instruction on x86 will actually save some information uh, about the call stack so you can unwind, uh, you know, and also return to the caller using ret. In this case, the compiler determines that we can actually fold these into jumps and not, and we don't actually require additional uh, stack space, and it'll actually just change those to jump instructions, at which point you really don't have uh, any call stack information to unwind from. Uh, so in, you know, if you pop this open in a debugger without optim optimization on the left, you'll see everything looks sane. To the right, you'll see that everything except for the innermost tail call is essentially optimized out. So at this point, the debugger actually has to do all sorts of weird heuristics to try to disambiguate uh, what the origin of a call site could be. Uh, and I, I, may, I might be over my time, I don't know, but... Um, Dwarf and debuggers are great uh, and depressing. It's cool stuff. But uh, yeah, follow me, uh, and I, uh, I'll be posting a couple of write-ups on uh, a lot more interesting stuff. So what are different ways we could uh, abuse Dwarf? How do you marry things like reversible debugging and tracing with Dwarf, etc.? Thank you.